Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. What a wonderful day. I'm not sure exactly what things to express, but they are happiness, they are comfort from the prayer that was given, the intercessory prayer, to friendship, to many other feelings, all very, very positive. I'm very, very thankful to be here, my wife Beverly and I, to become acquainted with the Church of God International, which is not the first time that we've met, as was mentioned, leaders of your church, of the church, have come to visit our home office in May this year. And I see that you're coming back in December sometimes, so that's my spying out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wanted to just express deepest gratitude for being here and thankful for the members of the United Church of God who also have joined us here today. I want to especially thank Mr. Bill Watson and his wife Margie for making us feel so welcome, so very, very welcome. I watched several things on the CGI.org website and just really appreciated the program on Spiritism that I just watched a couple of days ago. It was one of the best programs I had heard about the subject of Spiritism. And since Satan is the god of this world, it just, and a number of things here recent have pointed that out even more demonstrably that that was more than just a program debunking Halloween, but really talking about the fact that the god of this world is Satan the devil. I feel that we are brothers, cousins, friends, and it's wonderful that people from many decades now have been able to reconnect. I don't think it's going to be another 30, 40 years before we see each other again. We've had a number of things here that we have tried to uh, do work on together. One of them was the Feast of Tabernacles in the Land Between the Lakes. And how many of you went to the Land Between the Lakes? Are there any hands? Okay, so some of you have i gotten acquainted with Chris Rowland, who was able to speak there a couple of times, plus our brethren from Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, who came up from that church up to uh, the feast site there. But that type of activity is healthy and wonderful. It was wonderful to sing hymns, once again, that we are familiar with, that we had heard, and we saw and paged through the rest of the book to see what else they got there in their book. <laughs> that, was, that was very, very healthy for us, too. And uh, it was just very wonderful to see the order of services. We just feel very much at home with the three hymns, the prayer, and we appreciated the intercessor prayer. We do that sometimes too. And it was wonderful to see everybody stand up and everybody honor and stand before God, beseeching him for his help for the people who are in special needs. I also want to, as I note the cameras again, to say hello to everybody out in the internet and uh, can't see you, but you can see me. Hope. Also, I've gotten to know others. Uh, Wynn Skelton, I've talked to him on the telephone. Uh, but one thing I do find out, one thing that I have found is that I feel a very comfortable spirit. I feel very comfortable. Whenever I call Bill Watson, I just feel like I've known him for a long time, even though the first time that we had met was in May of this past year. I have been in the ministry since 1969. Actually, that's when I began as a ministerial trainee, and continued in that role for more than 40 years. I have pastored, uh, was started as a trainee, but pastored churches in Kentucky, in uh, Minnesota, in uh, uh, lately, most lately in Indiana. I have also worked in church administration back in the Worldwide Church of God, and uh, have fallen into the work of, once again, ministerial services with United Church of God, and upon the death of our beloved president, Dennis Luker, I was able to, I was chosen to be president of the United Church of God and have served in that role for the past three, on almost three and a half years. We published the Beyond Today magazine. We have put all of our media under one name, Beyond Today. If you have seen on the backs of some of our cars, the vehicles here, you'll see the Beyond Today window cling, and the window cling just says Beyond Today is to make people curious as to what Beyond Today is. Is it a youth group? Is it a political movement? Is it, what is it? People type in on the URL Beyond Today and they will get a plethora of contacts with everything that we do with Beyond Today. But we put the magazine and our webcast and our television all under one name, uh, Beyond Today, as we market that. I have really appreciated what I have seen on Armor of God as well, and I was very impressed by the numbers that Bill Watson had uh, brought forward. In fact, I want to see more things now. Now that I've seen 
uh, everything here. I'm going to be very, very curious as to more of the work that is being done there. You mentioned about your new website. We have put a lot of effort into upgrading our website over the past two years where we've made it not only mobile first, but also a site that really is a repository of thousands and thousands of pages of content about our beliefs and what we stand. We have as many as over a million unique visitors per month. Usually it comes in December, which is the biggest question of the year, when was Christ born? But nonetheless, we do have a lot of people who come to our website on what's called long tail searches. They ask a question about life. They ask a question about uh, you know, various things about life. And oftentimes, we're one of the first places where they find an answer. Also, when people ask questions such as, where is there a Sabbath keeping group near us? Oftentimes, we're very much at the top. Organically, people have come to uh, the very top of Beyond Today website, which is part of the UCG website. But if you type in Beyond Today, you will get to almost everything in the church very, very quickly. And it's made to be mobile friendly so that when the 60 to 70 percent of people now who access the website access it through a telephone or through a tablet, it'll be appropriately formatted to where they can read it easily or watch a video or interact with it on a mobile. But if they're on a bigger desktop or laptop computer, it'll show up in that format automatically. So the technology is shifting now to people becoming more mobile. <clears throat> Our Beyond Today magazine is now published by close to 300,000 circulation. Our website contains 60,000 pages of content. So you could have any number of subjects that we have covered in the past 21 years. Uh, that content is alive and well by searching. So if you would like to kind of learn to see what we have in our website, just go to the very easy search box, ask anything, either a series of words or a single word about any particular topics. You will find a plethora of information about the church or about what we say on the subject. We have 200 in the ministry, the United Church of God in the United States. Our television is on the Word Network, and we have just started streaming in the few months with premium streaming on Roku, on Amazon Fire Television, and also Apple TV. That was a because they're very selective of whom they choose. And oftentimes groups with values that, such as we have are, are groups that are rejected, but Apple Television accepted us. Also Samsung Smart Television. And I am very anxious to see the debate. Maybe my wife and I will watch the debate tonight uh, as we drive. That is very interesting what you're doing in interacting and having a discussion with other groups, Muslim, Protestant, and uh, who knows what else you have, uh, that you, who else you'll be uh, talking to. But that's very courageous and evangelistic, and I certainly appreciate the spirit in which that is done. An example to uh, all of us. Well, today I thought about talking about a subject that maybe that is near and dear to all of us, and with myself, very much so in the past few years. It's a subject that those of us who have been in the Church of God in its various formats may not have been one that has been brought to its full. Partial definitions of this important subject have been given, but I don't think a fuller def fullest definition has been given. But it's a word that is used very, very openly and very freely in the New Testament. Every one of Paul's letters greets churches with this particular word. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul challenges the people in Ephesus, one of his favorite churches, about their understanding about everything regarding Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ. I want you to understand the full dimension of Christ. Not just his name, not just a few facts, not something that you have heard in passing, but understand the full dimension of Jesus Christ, his height, breadth, and width. To know, verse 19, the love of 
Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And can we honestly say to ourselves that we understand the fullness of God on various doctrines and topics that are revealed in the Bible? Or do we have just a perfunctory or just a very, very hazy knowledge of them? As Christians who are studying and learning and developing and growing, we need to consider, do I know everything about the subject? How much more can I learn? And do I understand all the dimensions? God has many dimensions. And we're never told to stop studying the Bible because every year that goes by, we should understand more and more deeply about various topics and doctrines that God presents to us. In the first chapter of Ephesians, turn back to chapters. The Apostle Paul tells this church his wish that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He says, I really want you to get it. I really want you to get it fully. And I want it to come from God, to understand those things that relate to him, to us, to our relationship, to our eternity. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, they know, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the workings of his mighty power. You know, we in this past century have learned more about the greatness of God through astronomy, you know, from how great our universe is. And mankind's knowledge of just the vastness of the universe has expanded both outwardly and also microscopically, to the greatness of God's workings. In the same way, doctrinally, we should be understanding things more fully and more deeply to a greater and broader extent in its application in our personal lives. Well, what is the word that I am going to be talking about today? That word is grace. Everybody's heard of the word grace. We all have various knowledge of what grace is. And if I was to go down the aisles here and ask, could you please give me a one or two sentence definition of grace, we'd probably find that there are various facets or various definitions that aren't all the same. They're not in contradiction with one another, but they're not the whole story. And my question to us is today, do we know as much as we should about grace? And what should we understand about what God means by grace? This is a subject that is vital for our spiritual well-being and eternity. And it's been a subject that's been at times controversial and even feared. Grace It's a kind of ease. It's a kind of kindness that we should be cautious about. It may lead us into being permissive. And we certainly wouldn't want that. It's feared because of permissiveness. That one could be led to compromise with those matters dealing with God, his law, his commandments, and his truth that we certainly didn't want. And we have seen people who have left. We've people, seen people who have gone astray after being on the straight and narrow as far as obedience to God. And we certainly don't want to go in that direction. For many of us, and for years, the definition of grace was unmerited pardon. It's something I don't deserve, but it's being given to me by God. Is that definition of grace correct? Absolutely. Is it totally correct? Is it all there is about grace? Absolutely not. Grace is far bigger. Is grace the forgiveness of sins? Where your sins are forgiven? The answer is yes. Once again, it's only a small part of understanding the subject of grace. And what I'm asking today for all of us, do we understand the fullness of this subject? Do we understand everything that it entails? When the Apostle Paul wrote to congregations in his letters, grace and peace to you from God the Father, that wasn't just a pleasantry. It wasn't just like, hello. You know, we don't think too much of the word hello. 
It meant something. It is something he wished. It was a very important understanding to him. The biblical study of grace is not complex. That's the good news. I'm not going to involve ourselves in a deep doctrinal discussion that requires lexicons and requires us to understand the Greek and the Hebrew of that period to get the full meaning of the term. It is not. There's only one word for grace in the Old Testament. There's only one word for grace in the New Testament. Of course, there are synonyms as well, but grace itself is defined by only one Greek word or one Hebrew word. It's not that hard. The definition of those words is not complex. It's quite straightforward. And the subject is rather straightforward as well. And we'll find that by truly understanding grace, it'll make us even more determined to want to please God, to keep his commandments, to keep his laws, to be faithful to him. And all those things that really make for a Christian whose spirit is right before God. The subject of grace is not a New Testament phenomenon. I think we know that. But nonetheless, it was just as strong in the Old Testament as it was in the New. The subject, the first reference to grace, goes back to Genesis chapter 6. It goes back to the very beginnings of God's working with mankind. And the word that is used for grace in Psalms and Proverbs and Zechariah and other places is the word that was used here in Genesis chapter 6. Turn to Genesis chapter 6 where we find the first reference to the word grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What does that word mean? The Hebrew word is hen, C-H-E-N, sometimes spelled K-H-A-N-E, which means, here are the definitions of the word. Once again, not complicated at all. Kindness, favor, beauty, graciousness, being pleasant, being precious, and being well-favored. That's what that word means. So what did it mean that Noah found grace in the sight of God? He was found in favor with God. He was on God's good side. God approved of him. God said, you're okay. Was Noah perfect? Absolutely not. We know that he wasn't perfect. We know that he, even after the flood, had lapses. But he was a person in whom God could trust. God liked Noah. He could work with Noah. You know who I want to find grace with? Not as much maybe as with God, but close. I want to find grace with my wife. I want to find to be in good standing with your mate. You want to be on good terms. And you know, when you're on good terms, everything goes well. When you're on good terms, when you're favored, and there are those little specks, and there are those little speck things that, you know, come up in life, they're overlooked. When you're in good stead, when you're in, under, in grace, in a relationship of grace. When things, when you're not in grace, the slightest little specks become big deals and they're picked on when you're not in grace. You want to be in grace with your employer, the person you work for. You want to have him think well of you because of the work that you do and he thinks well of you for a reason because you're a good guy, you're a good woman, good lady. You do your work well. And when you're in good standing with your mate or with your employer, if you work late for work for five or ten minutes, no problem. No problem whatsoever. Because you're in good stead, you're in a grace relationship with your employer. However, if you're not, uh-oh, you're late. We can't have that on this job. You want to be in grace, and the reason you are 
a friend is because you have a relationship of graciousness. It simply means to be on someone's good side. Noah was on God's good side. And we can understand a lot about the subject of grace by understanding this concept, which relates to the New Testament as well. In the New Testament, there is one word for grace, as I said, and that word is charis, which is the base, the definition for, or the word that's translated also charisma, love, you know, charity, gift. All those words come from charis. And this is graciousness as a manner or an act of the divine influence upon the heart, including gratitude. Charis means to be acceptable. You're acceptable. You're fine. And you know how you get together with people. And you have an immediate sense of being accepted with one another. As compared to being at odds with one another. You want to be in a state of grace with them. It also means a gift, liberality, pleasure, and thanksgiving. But the main understanding, the main definition, is this aspect of being acceptable. And one of the problems with the word grace in the English language is that it's kind of murky. You know, grace is used for different things, including prayer, you know, saying grace. And you hear the word grace, and it kind of means several different things. It really struck me when I was visiting in Ukraine with the Sabbatarian ministers, and I had not really heard the word for grace in the Ukrainian and Russian languages. But then when we got to talking about it, they used the words blagodat. And I thought, oh, well, that's grace. Certainly it is. I thought, well, that's very clear. That's very, very clear. It's a combination of two words, blagodat. Blago is good, and dat is give. The giving of good. Grace means the giving of good. And in Russian, the word blagodat simply means God's giving of good. Wonderful. Very, very clear. Interesting that the word blessing is quite similar. It's blagoslova, which means good word. Blessing means good word. Grace means good giving of good. The problem with us with our definitions of grace is they have been too restrictive and narrow, and they sometimes pit concepts one against another when they should be supporting one another and bringing a whole picture together. An important rule of Bible study is that the book, the Bible is a book of addition, of putting things together. If something is said in one place, about a subject and something else is said about it in a different place, you add those two together for the most part, almost always. You don't pit them one against another. You don't say, do you want law or do you want grace? And people become confused. Well, which one do I want? Why can't you have both? That's too bad. There's a place in the Bible, in the, New, in the book of Proverbs, that says, Answer a fool according to his folly. And in the next verse it says, answer not a fool according to his folly. Some critics even go to the say, well, see, there's a goal. The Bible just contradicts itself right there, right in front of you. No, both are true. There are times when somebody says something foolish and you roll your eyes and stay silent. There are other times when somebody says something foolish when you have to speak up and you have to approach him or her and say, let's talk about this. There are times when you answer. There are times when you don't answer. There's a power in the and. There's a tyranny in the or. Do you want this or do you want that? Do you want a car with an engine or do you want one with a transmission? Oh, I'm so confused. Which one do I want? You need both. You need them all together. You don't pit them one against another. And I feel that we have minimized grace 
because we've had too many little restrictive definitions. And we've been so careful about having them all connected together to form a subject that is beautiful and huge and reflects the love and the mind of God towards mankind. And when we finish this sermon today, we'll see that subjects about the kingdom of God, the law itself is a big part of God's grace. The law of God itself is God's giving of goodness. The law is holy, just, and good. It was intended to be something that's a gift, a charitable gift from God to us. So it's no mistake that the Apostle Paul greeted every church that he had spoken to in Asia Minor or Europe and said, grace and peace to you from God the Father. You know, one thing I really want in life, right now at the stage where I'm in, is I do want God's grace. I do want to be on his good side. I want to be on the good side of the people I associate with. I want to be on the good side of my wife. And I want peace. Oftentimes I end my letters, whether I write in our weekly newsletter to the church, grace and peace from God the Father, because I feel like these words are so very, very important. Okay, let's take a look at a number of passages in the New Testament. A number of passages in the New Testament, uh, pardon me, Old Testament first, that relate to the word grace. And there are many others. You can look them up yourselves, do a concordant Bible study. Psalm 84 and verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God wants to give grace. This is God of the Old Testament saying, I want to give it. I have these gifts. I have this treasure. I want to give it to you. Please accept it. Doesn't want to withhold it from those who walk uprightly. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 32. A number of Proverbs that we'll just take a quick look at. Proverbs 3 and verse 32. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. Verse 34. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. So one way to be a recipient of God's goodness, God's grace, all those things that he just so desperately wants to give to us is humility. He gives grace to the humble. Verse 9, Proverbs 4, verse 9, continue. She, wisdom and understanding, will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Proverbs 22, in verse 11. He who loves purity of heart, he who is a person who is transparent, purity, nothing hidden, clean, and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. He'll have friendship across a wide range, including the king himself. Has grace on his lips. Has grace in the way he speaks. Gracious talk. There are people who are not gracious in how they speak. And people don't like to be around them. But a person who is gracious in his speech and language and composure is a person who even the king will be his friend. We have to learn to be gracious. Okay, more. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. This is a prophecy of the future, but recorded in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. God's going to not just kind of give grace and just kind of throw a little bit of a bone here to some people in the future. I'm going to forgive your sins. Your unmerited pardon. You're, you're pardoned. 
The President of the United States here will be giving pardons here in the next month or two to criminals. He's going to be throwing out little bones to people. And then there won't be any more pardons for four more years from the President. Well, God is going to pour out a spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. So it talks about a future time of grace. I like this one in, Prophet, in Jeremiah chapter 31, in verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 31, in verse 2, speaking of the new covenant, is prophesied, predicted. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Wilderness Israel when I went to give him rest. You know, the whole event, the whole experience of the Exodus was God's grace. He gave it to people that he favored. And some of them weren't very nice to him. They were just a downtrodden people, complained, and so forth. But he already promised to their predecessors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give them this grace, and he did. But the whole experience of being freed from slavery, of going into the promised land, of being God's special people, was an act of grace from God himself, the giving of good. When you understand the subject of grace, you begin to understand the mind and the spirit and the depth of God of what he wants to do and what he wants to give and what he wants to pass on. What we do for our children is just minusculely compared to the goodness that God wants to pour out upon those who can receive it. And ultimately, he wants to pour out his grace upon all mankind. The New Testament. Grace appears in Luke chapter 2 with a child, Jesus. Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And the way Luke describes this, it's interesting that he, in his writing and his thinking and the way he defined the relationship between God the Father and the one who became the incarnate God, Jesus. That was an act of grace. The grace of God was there watching, protecting, and being with Jesus all the way. So this is obviously a far more expanded definition of grace. Jesus did not need unmerited pardon, and neither was it the forgiveness of sin. It was the goodness of God that was applied to him. Let's take a look at one of those passages now that speaks of what is apparently a contradiction or what people make into a contradiction and perhaps ratchet into being the law as something unacceptable on one side because there's grace on the other. John chapter 1, and verse 17. Remember, again, the Bible is a book of addition, not subtraction. John chapter 1 and verse 17. The law was given through Moses. And we know that so well, Exodus 20. When Israel came out of Egypt, there was a codified law that was given in the commandments and then followed by the statutes. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So on the surface, it may appear that this grace is something in opposition to the law of Moses. This is just talking about two different periods in history. The law was given through Moses. It doesn't say the law was done away with and then grace came replacing it in some way. The grace of Jesus Christ towards us is the salvation that's been given to us. It's the fact that he came to die for our sins, to take the bullet, so to speak, for our sins. And was able to say, you're clean, you're forgiven, you are under grace because of what I have done. But he's the one who took the bullet for the law that was broken. God is both just and justifier. 
The law came through Moses in its codified format, and grace, the forgiveness of sin, came through Jesus Christ. Both statements are true and not competing. They actually bring together a beautiful definition, a beautiful fullness of understanding law and grace. There's a period when the law was given, and another period at time when focus was attend, put on Christ pouring out his grace on mankind. They're not competing concepts. Again, the subject of grace, and again, it's not complex because there's only one word in the Old Testament and one word in the New Testament. You can find that word very, very quickly. This charisma, charis. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 33, and believe me, this is one of my verses that I need to be praying more and that all of us need to be praying more for in the churches of God. When the New Testament church began, there was great power of the apostles. There was, with great power, the apostles went out preaching the message of Christ's resurrection. They gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And they came to crowds that assembled in the synagogues, in public places. And great grace was upon them all, upon the people who listened. You know, one thing that I pray, God, the people that we speak to, whether it be the armor of God, whether it be a Beyond Today public appearance campaign, that please place your grace upon the hearts of the people who are coming to understand truths as you and I did half a century ago. And were moved by these truths and said, this is it. I get it. I get the Bible in a way that I hadn't gotten it before. I understand the deeper things of God because you know why? Because great grace was placed upon us in opening our hearts and minds to understanding this. Our prayer would be, and should be, God, open the minds of the people. That's what happened in the New Testament. That's what happened on the very first day that the New Testament church was established. When thousands of people were baptized, that in itself was the miracle of the day. There were the tongues of fire, understanding different languages, but the big miracle of the day was the conversions that took place on that day. That was the great grace that was upon them all. It's a great gift from Jesus Christ and God the Father to open up the hearts to receive the grace that Jesus Christ wants to give us. And part of that is understanding his law. I look upon the laws of the holy days as being the graciousness of God, not only to give me these days to worship and celebrate on that are biblical, but also to open up an entire new reality of what God is doing with us from personally with the Passover all the way to the last great day, the eighth day in Leviticus 23, and opening up his truth to everyone. That is a great opening of the mind. And I look upon that as grace. And the observance of these days is a very gracious experience. Those of you who've gone to the Feast of Tabernacles year in and year out, certainly for us it is the highlight of the year. Not only because it's enjoyable to be at some of the beautiful locations that we've gone to around the world, but to learn about the depth of God's grace and what he's doing for mankind. And the greatest act of graciousness is the gift of eternal life. That's what we all want, the gift of eternal life. That is charisma, <laughs> that's charis, that's the gift. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans 5 and verse 17. For if the one man's offense, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, and it did, Adam disobeyed God and was cast out of the Garden of Eden and, and given 
no access, further access to the tree of life, and death passed on all of us. Much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So here it speaks about the one that death reigned upon all of mankind because man was cut off from that tree that gave eternal life because he disobeyed God and God said, if you eat that tree, you will die. And so Adam was cast out. All of us have had that deplorable thing of death that's come upon us and we see people die around us and more will die around us and we will die. That's an enemy. But you know what grace is? The grace is the gift of righteousness and life through the one, Jesus Christ. Eternity. That's going to be given to us. There would have been no need for grace unless man put himself into, put himself into position of needing it because of his transgressions, because of his breaking the law. And as a result, Jesus Christ paid the consequences, paid for the sins that we have committed, paid the penalty so that we, he could give us that gift of eternal life. We understand truly the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what it all meant, what it meant for God, how important it was, and what a great present and gift it was for us. That was the greatest act of grace of all experience divine and human, the giving of life to all of us. That is God's grace. Romans chapter 11. Turn ahead. Six chapters. Romans chapter 11 and verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, as I said in Acts chapter 4, great grace fell upon them all as God opened the hearts of people listening to the evangelistic message of the apostles. Now, those of us who are called, those of us who are right here, we're the ones who are called. This calling is called the election of grace. Verse 6, and if by grace, then it is no longer of works. It had nothing to do with us applying for this. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But it is for works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. You're just explaining the concept. There are things that we do. But the things that we do don't grant us, give us grace. Grace is something that comes from God. But he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to those who are trying. He gives grace to those who are pleasing God. But they don't earn it. It's those who get on his good side, if you want to put it that way. Grace inherently is not earned. A gift inherently is not earned. It is given to one who is well favored. Just ask yourself, who do you give gifts to? Who do you give gifts to? You give gifts to people you like. You don't think of somebody that this person is annoying and irritating. I don't like him, but I think I'll get him a gift. You give gifts to your children because you love your children. There's somebody at work or there's somebody in the office. Sometimes people surprise one another in our office at the home office and give them a little gift. I give little bonuses. I give little you know, cards uh, you know, that have uh, some money attached to them to some of our employees from time to time. Done a great job. This was great. Really appreciate your extra work on this project. Now here's a little card here for you, a little shopping card, whatever, with so, much, so many dollars on it. Because I really appreciate your work. They weren't expecting it. it may have been part of their salary, but they went above and beyond. And I really appreciated the work that they had done. we just given some gift cards here to our staff that worked at, did extra jobs for the feast, spent extra hours doing the webcast and doing other things like that. We gave them a gift card. It was an act of grace because we like these people, because we appreciate their work. But I know them too. They're not perfect. But I love them. I really appreciate the work that they do. And that's the relationship similarly that we have with our God and how he 
has us in his hands of grace. We see the Apostle Paul, the struggles that he had. Romans chapter 7, verse 23. While the word grace is not word used directly here, it shows the relationship that the Apostle Paul, who was a person that had really done a fantastic work in preaching the gospel to the Asian and European worlds. He did a tremendous job. But in Romans chapter 7, he makes an amazing admission about what he was like what his nature was. He says in verse 23 of Romans chapter 7, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. He speaks about internal conflict that he had when he wrote the book of Romans in the 50s AD. This is decades after he had started his ministry in a very profound way. Other books had been written before. He talks about the conflict that he had just fighting his nature, knowing what was right and what his nature was like. And he wasn't excusing it. He says, and brings me into the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. We don't know what those sins are. We don't know what thoughts he had. Probably no different than many thoughts people have today. Who knows? That's not important. He just says it was a battle. How many of us have battles? He says in verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, I hate myself. This is quite an admission by an apostle to make. And one that's recorded for all eternity. Who will deliver me from this body of death? How am I going to get out of this? He says, I thank God, verse 25, through Jesus Christ our Lord, that I will be delivered. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin, but I will be delivered by Jesus Christ because he's going to help me. I'll be in his gracious hands, and he will help me. He wasn't excusing his sin. He wasn't excusing or wanting him to take it away. He was going to help him through that. The Apostle Paul relied on grace to help him with the weakness of his flesh. Now, many of us do not have weaknesses in our flesh that we have to cry out to God in seeking him and say, save me from myself. I call upon the grace of God, the goodness of God, the giving of his goodness to help me. What are we struggling with for which we need the grace of God? Is it alcohol? Not telling the truth? Lack of honesty, pornography, there are many things out there. Secret problems that seemingly don't go away, and that is our cross to bear. But we also have to be very careful, very, very careful, because the Apostle Paul already foresaw that people might be using the grace of God as license. And that's the fear that people have. The Apostle Paul knew that well. He knew that people would take advantage of it right away when he preached this freedom. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Say, oh, I can repent later. I can repent later. Because, you know, God will... Come in there and put me under his grace. Forgive me the sins, and then I can continue doing what I'm doing. The Apostle Paul knew that that would happen, and that's what happens. But he makes it very, very clear in verse 2. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He makes it very, very clear, the stand of law and grace. Grace cannot be used to abuse the law of God. How clear can you get? You know, what grace ought to do, what grace ought to encourage us in, is this. In Romans chapter 2, in verse 4, 
I feel this is one of the most encouraging passages in the New Testament, showing the goodness of God. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his grace, forbearance and long-suffering? Do you take for granted the goodness of God, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The grace of God should lead us to repent of our sins. That God has saved us from the consequence. We weren't picked up for this infraction. We didn't have to go to jail or whatever. The goodness of God leads us to repent. We say, oh, I need to repent. I really need to stop. I really need to change. Not because I'm being spanked into doing so, but because God is being good to me. Because God is pouring out his blessings upon me. And how can I despise that? How can I thumb my nose at God's goodness? Rather, I should be saying, God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. Your goodness is going to make me committed to repent of my sins. The New Testament message is one of repentance. That's where God wants us to get to. Jesus Christ began his ministry in preaching about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand in the first chapter of Mark. And then what? What next? Repent. Repent. The New Testament church started on the day of Pentecost. In Jerusalem, the apostle Peter gave a sermon and said, you have killed Christ, talking to the audience that just a couple of months before that were saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You have killed Christ. And this audience that was already prepared for this sermon said, men and brethren, what do we do? What do we do? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. Receive those good things from God. But our attitude should be that when God does the wonderful things that he does for us in our lives, and as you look back over the last decades, and especially in America at this time of Thanksgiving, one of the aspects of Thanksgiving is, God, thank you for all the good that you have done for me. What can I do now? What's my responsibility? Because of your grace, I should be more law-abiding, more law-keeping, more righteous, and doing those things that please you. I should be changing. I should be transforming and renewing my spirit. I shouldn't just take advantage of your goodness and take your goodness and your graciousness and all the wonderful love that you shower upon me as something that is like receiving welfare. You just get it every week, you know, and you don't have to do anything for it, and it comes your way. And it causes something that's an entitlement. Grace is not an entitlement. Grace is given for the purpose of leading us to repentance, to understanding the depths of what God's plan is for us. You know, the Bible begins with a beautiful story of man's leaving God in being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. But the Bible also ends in Revelation 21 with a beautiful story about the restoration of man in the Garden of Eden and where God comes and dwells with mankind. This is what God wants to give to us. So what is grace? Grace is forgiveness, unmerited pardon. Grace is the law of God. It's not law or grace. The law is part of God's grace. Grace is reconciliation. There's nothing more that I like than to be reconciled to people where we may have had bumps in relationships. That's a wonderful blessing. And the blessing that Jesus Christ wants to give us is a reconciliation between God and man. The kingdom of God is God's grace. Eternal life is the great grace of God. Rulership, management of the vast universe that's ahead there before us is a Part of God's grace and his gift for mankind. He's given us the gift of life 
He's given us a gift of grace. The family relationship to where we can call Jesus our brother, and we can look to our Father and cry out, Abba, Father, and praying to him, what a gift. What a gift of understanding that. Our job now is to be growing in grace and knowledge. In fact, the Apostle Peter concludes, and where I will conclude here today, 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 18. Because both the Apostle Peter and Paul, except that Paul wrote more books, and therefore it appears in Paul's writings more than in Peter's, both understood grace as a common staple word and its definition in proper understanding in the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. And that is what I admonish all of us here today. Are we growing in grace? In other words, growing in the understanding to see how big it is, as I began with understanding the full measure, the full dimensions of Jesus Christ, the full dimensions of this particular word, concept, belief, doctrine. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. So let's learn everything about Christ as we have heard in our first scripture. Let's understand the full dimension of Christ.